from Matthew 1, the beginning of the New Covenant, the New Testament for us. Please still pass through with your spirit. Help us to listen and to understand and to obey. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 1, the first book of the New Testament, and of course the introduction to Jesus. There's a couple things we're going to look at this morning. Uh, we're going to look at a couple of the titles of Jesus. Now there are so many titles of Jesus. There, are, I've seen almost an endless list of, G of titles that deal with who Jesus is. Now a title, in a certain sense, does require a response. I want you to consider this, that if somebody walked through the door and they said, I am the mayor, there's a certain level of respect that is either due or perhaps they deserve uh, some disrespect for their actions, depending on if, if, if you walk out the door today and uh, the president of the United States confronted you, there's a certain response that re is required. You might say, well, that's not my president and you lied in the vote or whatever. You know, <laughs> you're a criminal, you're not a president, you're not a king, right? Well, Jesus is primarily king, and that's the title we're focusing on primarily today. There are three real titles in Matthew chapter 1 that we're going to draw out in the scriptures and look at it because there is a, a response that is required of us. When you find out that someone has a certain authority, there is a response that is necessary. If you've ever been in a situation, you say, I won't stand for it. This is not right. I want to talk to the manager. And they say, well, I am the manager. Oh, well, I'm sorry. Um, how about the owner? Is he around? <laughs> I am the owner. <laughs> you think about it. A title bears some authority, and uh, there's also this responsibility that comes to the person confronted with that title and authority. So I want to look at a few of Jesus here. You're in Matthew chapter 1. Look at verse number 16. Matthew chapter 1, verse number 16. And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. He is called Christ. This is an important title. This is the first title we're going to look at. And it is, uh, uh, it's a name of authority. There is no other Christ that has ever lived. If there is one that claims to be a Christ, yea, they are a false Christ. The term Christ is, to some of us, perhaps an ambiguous term. Well, some people think it means this, or others say that. I do want to define it for you out of the Scriptures so that we know exactly what we're dealing with. If you go back to the language that this was written in, it does mean anointed, which the Lord Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, it was said that the Son would be the anointed one. He would be uh, the Lord's anointed. So there is an alignment with there. That's an important understanding. Let's read the next three verses, 16, 17, and 18 together. Look at verse 16 again. And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. He's called Christ. Verse 17, so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations, and from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. The child was the Christ. The child was from God. It was something holy. We see Christ mentioned in these three verses. We see it three times. If you would, go to John chapter 1 for me. In Psalm 47, it says, For the Lord is most terrible. He is a great king over all the earth. And this is the first definition of Christ we're going to look at. That it means that he is the king. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 2, it says, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? This was yet another title, but these titles complement each other. They go together. He being Christ, it does mean that he is the one anointed to be king. Now, if you remember, David was anointed to be king. Saul was anointed. There were a certain lineage of men that were anointed for that. And Christ will sit on David's throne. He, ha he is part of that kingdom. And this is important because we have fleshly titles. We're in the kingdom of America. Well, if DeSantis keeps on, it'll just be the kingdom of Florida, right? <laughs> but 
whether or not that's all of us or just us. Anyway, taking some very interesting stands, isn't he, right? You say, well, well, I like that king, but I don't like the one up there. And that makes sense. He's more of our local guy, right? Well, and, and this is us looking at it through fleshly eyes, through political eyes, and we need to see Jesus through spiritual eyes. He is a king. He will rule and reign on the earth. We will rule and reign with him. He was born king of the Jews. It said in Matthew 2, he says, For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. He will rule. That is coming in the future. He did act as a king in a certain sense while on the earth, but he didn't really fulfill all of those prophecies. And that's where some people had a hard time understanding who the Christ was or what maybe they had uh, some reservations of what they expected the Christ to do when he arrived. And this is important because in the end times, there will be a false kingdom of Israel. They will have a false Christ. They will look for a political Messiah. They will say, this is the king of the Jews. He is the king of Israel. He will liberate us. He will establish our earthly kingdom, and it will cause a bunch of confusion. Ultimately, that man will demand to be worshipped as the Lord Jesus Christ deserved to be worshipped being God. But that man will be uh, the devil incarnate, per se. Here in John chapter 1, let's look at verse number 29. John chapter 1, verse number 29, the next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Go to verse 34. Again, another title. It all ties together with what Christ is. Verse 34, And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Again, dealing with who Christ is, jump down to verse 41. He first findeth his own brother, Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which being interpreted is the Christ. We found the Messiah being interpreted, that's Christ. So what is Christ? Well, Christ means Messiah. Now, Messiah is a very unique word. We see it twice in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 9. We see it twice in the book of John, right here in John 1, 41. Jump ahead to John chapter 4. Go to John chapter 4. So Christ means anointed. Jesus is anointed to be the king, but that's not all that he was anointed to do. His kingdom was larger than just that. You're in John chapter 4, find verse number 25. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Of course, Jesus said, uh, Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. What a proclamation. He says, I am. Well, I know the Messiah is coming. I know Christ will be here. And he says, I am the anointed one. I am that king to come. I am the one that's fulfilling the prophecy. She already believed in Christ, expecting him to arrive. Jesus, when he arrived, was fulfilling all manner of prophecy. And this is such an awesome verse because it's giving us some insight that there were those that knew Christ was coming. Jesus, didn't hesitate to claim to be the Christ, the Messiah, which means he's the Lamb of God to take away our sins. He is the Son of God, which is God with us. And we see all of that. Uh, but there's a little bit more to it. Look at verse 42 in the same chapter. Verse, actually, look at verse 41. And many more believed because of his own word and said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves and know that this indeed is the Christ, the Savior of the world. It's interesting, all the other Bibles will take out that word, the Christ, right here. Why? Because they don't want to pair that definition with the Savior of the world. What was Jesus anointed or appointed uh, to come and do? Well, he was to be a king. He's to be our Savior. He is the one that will save us from our sins. Christ is our Redeemer. He is a king over all the earth. And he deserves our respect. He deserves to be honored and glorified. Go to John chapter 18. Flip ahead to John chapter 18, if you would. In John 12, he says, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. 
Jesus came in and pronounced and showed himself to be king, fulfilling it. In 1 Timothy 6, it uses the phrase that he is king of kings and lord of lords. It uses that same phrase in Revelation 17 and Revelation 19. Jesus isn't just some king. He is the king of kings. He is the king over all the kings of the earth. He is the king that even before he arrived, he had more authority over the kings of the earth than any man that's ever lived on the earth. We've had many examples of a one world government government or a world ruler and even they must bow their knee to Jesus one day every man will bow every person will bow their knee to the Lord Jesus Christ because he is the Lord of Lords he is the King of Kings he's the boss of bosses he's the presidents of presidents it doesn't matter and listen he alone deserves all the glory and honor and worship and at this time of year when we try to remind people that Jesus has come he has died for them and he is resurrected, there comes with this phrase that he is the Lord Jesus Christ, there is a responsibility to every one of us to respond to his authority. You have a responsibility. Now you say, well, well Pastor Fannin, I'm saved. I've already responded. I believe in him. I've trusted in him as my Savior. I do believe that he has died for all of my sins and that it's everlasting life. I can't lose it. Amen. Thank God. That's the first call. But you know, there's another call in your life. There is a call unto discipleship. There is a call from God to you, and he says, well, if I'm your king, and I'm your Lord, and you're in my spiritual kingdom, it's time for you to serve me. If you are saved, you are called a servant of the Most High God. Think about it. We must serve him. You're in John 18. Go to verse 33. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again, and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Say, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? They saying, Are you saying this, or did others tell you to ask it? Right? Verse 35, Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee me unto thee. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, listen to this, my kingdom is not of this world. Answer me this, man. Is God's kingdom of this world right now? Whose kingdom is on the earth? Who's in charge of the earth today? Satan, the lowercase g-o-d, right? He is the God of this world. Now, that doesn't mean that God doesn't have authority and power and uh, the ability to protect and to provide. Now, okay, don't, don't, don't confuse that, but understand, God is still in control, but he has a kingdom that's coming that will uh, just uh, annihilate every other kingdom that has existed. When you look at the prophecy in Daniel, we see that, that that kingdom that comes, boy, it destroys every other kingdom. There is nothing quite like it. Uh, just think about the reaction when many people when they were confronted with an angelic being, or when they were confronted with the Lord Jesus Christ, or when they saw him transfigured, they were overwhelmed at the spiritual realm. And that's coming one day. That's coming one day. And listen, when, when the kingdom of God shows up, everyone will know when it comes to you, when the Lord comes to you, it will get your attention. Look what he says in verse 36. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from hence. He says, it's not far from here. It's coming elsewhere. He tells us the kingdom of God is inside of us. When you call upon the name of the Lord and you're saved, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit moves inside of you. And listen, that kingdom is inside of you. You are one of his servants, but it's not here. He said, if it were on this earth, if it were uh, one that had administrations and walls and castles and that sort of thing, oh, well, we would fight, but not yet. The day will come when we will fight for the Lord, or with the Lord, I should say. Look at verse 37. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. If you're a Christian, then it's like he's calling you one that has heard the truth. You're of the truth if you're a Christian. If you're a child of God, you are one that has received the truth. You've heard his voice. You believe in him, and he has a purpose for you. It is to hear my voice. 
this is our job while we're on here, here on the earth. Go to Hebrews chapter 7 if you would. Go to Hebrews chapter number 7. Christ means anointed. That means king. That is the primary definition of that. It includes Savior. We saw that. There's another element that's important that goes along with his kingship that we need to see. You're in Hebrews chapter 7. Find verse number 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. Now this is a throwback to the story in Genesis 14. Abram met this man. His name was Melchizedek. But this man was not like any other man that's ever walked the earth. This man, it says he was both a king and a priest. It says he was the king and priest of the Most High God. Look at verse 2. To whom Abraham gave a tenth part of all. First, being by interpretation, king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. So he defines Salem, and we know that Jerusalem uh, deals with that Salem, I believe, and uh, Jesus himself, I think it's in Matthew 5, uh, referenced that, that, that Jerusalem was the city of the great king, and he's speaking of himself. Here we're seeing Melchizedek is king of Salem, which means king of peace. The Lord Jesus Christ is king of righteousness. He is king of peace, and he also holds the title as priest. Jesus was a prophet, a priest. He was the Messiah. He's a king. There are many titles that he holds. Look at verse 3. Without father, without mother. Now, wait a minute. How could this Melchizedek not have earthly parents? That doesn't make sense. It was a miracle. I believe it was the Lord Jesus Christ, before he was born as Jesus, that revealed himself to the main man Abraham, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. The Lord Jesus Christ as a priest, he didn't have a creation day, he wasn't made. He will not die, he will never cease to exist. The Son of God will exist forever, he has always existed. He being Christ means though, he is a continuing priest. Who do we bring our sacrifice to? Do we go down to the altar and we bring our lamb, our goat, our bull, and we say, well, I brought my turtle doves here, I'm going to confess my sin. I didn't know. All of that was a picture of Christ to come. He was the Lamb of God. He did take away the sin of the world. While you're in this chapter, go to verse 26, go to the end. For such an high priest became us. You know what it means when he became us? He became flesh and dwelt among us. This God entered into manhood on our behalf. What is Christ? Christ is the king of the universe. Christ is the priest that forgives sins. Christ is the savior and he's here with us. He says, for this high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners and made higher than the heavens. If you want to be conformed to the image of Christ as a believer, as a Christian, one day we will completely be conformed to that image at our resurrection. This is the image that you will be conformed to. If you want to live for Christ now, you should be homeless, holy, you should be harmless, you should be undefiled. That means keeping yourself unspotted from the world. He says, separate from sinners. Ultimately, one day we'll be made higher than the heavens along with the Lord, never as high as Him, but in His image we will be conformed to His image as He is. Go back to Matthew 1. Go back to Matthew 1. I told you we're going to look at three titles. Christ is the first, and it, uniquely it has three or more definitions inside of it. It's anointed, it's king, it's priest, it is Savior. But there's so much more to Jesus. I do just want to give you this information today and so here you go. Now you know who he is. Now there's a response that's required of you. You know that he's your king and you are in his kingdom. His kingdom is inside of you. You will serve and fight for him one day in his kingdom. What are you doing for the kingdom now? What are you doing today? Let's pick up where we left off. Look at verse number 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When, as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. 
Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. His name was called Jesus. Now this is important. You know, names mean things. Can I get an amen? Oh, yeah. amen. Is there anybody in here that has named a child after a particular thing because you know that names mean things? Yeah. Everyone. Names mean things, don't they? We have a child on the way, and it's not, well, I, I always like the sound, the ring of this name. No, I want to name the child something that would honor God. I want to name a child something that would honor God. Here, Jesus, we're given the definition of the name right here in the Scriptures. The Bible is your dictionary. What does Jesus mean? For he shall save his people from their sins. Now, many of you know that Jesus is the same as the name in the Old Testament, Joshua. Joshua uniquely had four different names in the Old Testament. It's all the same name, O.C., Hoshea, Jehoshua, Joshua. And that's what confuses a lot of the black Hebrew Israelites and other such, you know, Seventh-day Adventist type camps. You know, they want to go back to a Germanic saying of it and call it Yoshi or Yehoshua or something like that. No, here it says his name's Jesus. There is only one name by which we are saved. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't reject this name. Don't change this name. And don't think it's something else. The Bible tells us what Jesus means. It says, He shall save us from our sins. He shall save us from our sins. You know, Joshua means Jehovah saves. Jehovah saves us. And Jesus' name is? Jehovah saves. Jesus will save us from our sins. That was the purpose. That was his name. That was his intent. He is the Savior. And there's the next title. Jesus is our Savior. We just saw it in John, but here again we're seeing it just in the name Jesus. It means Savior. It means Savior. Go to Luke chapter 8. I want to show you something. Luke chapter number 8. In John 3, of course everybody knows John 3, 16, verse 17 says, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God sent Jesus into the world because Jesus is the Savior. He's the only one that can save you from your sins. And if you're trying to do it any other way, then you are not saved. We're out at the flea market yesterday preaching the gospel. What some great interactions we had. Brother Ross is engaged in this guy, and he it said something, Jesus, something on his shirt. He starts talking to the guy, and of course this guy seemed to have the right answers. I believe in Jesus. Oh, of course. And he says, is there anything you can do to lose it? He says, no, I'm 100% committed, and he kept talking. And I reached around, and I said, excuse me, sir, if you're not 100% committed, do you think you would still be saved? Oh, no, you got to have all the works. Now, here's the problem today. People have made Jesus in their own image. Yes. Jesus opened the door, but you have to walk through, and you got to keep walking, and you got to, boy, the, the Christian walk is hard. Well, that's true. There's a, a lot of works we should do, but that's not how we're saved. If you believe on a Jesus that doesn't save you permanently, then you have the wrong Jesus. Jesus saves. He has saved. It's done. It's once saved, always saved, or you're not saved. This is important. Jesus is our Savior. It's finished. We are saved because of what He's done. I want to show you in Luke 8, and, and for the sake of time, I'll make it brief here. I won't read the whole parable, but He was speaking of a parable. The parable of the sower, or the parable of the seed. Look at verse number 5, if you would. Luke 8, verse number 5. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. The fowls of the air devoured it. You know, it's interesting, we had chickens and a garden. We found out real quick you can't have both without some sort of uh, blockage, right? Some sort of fence. The chicken said, oh, you're planting seeds over here. Great, I'll just come and root that up, and I'll eat that, right? I mean, birds love to eat seeds. It's a no-brainer. Well, here he's trying to tell us the sower is sowing his seeds. The planter is planting his seeds. He's throwing it out, and the bird wants to come and steal that seed before it grows. The definition is given in verse number 11. Look at Luke 8, verse number 11. Now the parable is this. 
the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil, and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. The devil's that bird that comes and steals the seed as quick as they can. Lest it should grow and get some root and begin to bring forth a plant and begin to bring forth fruit. That's how the devil works. We went out, we passed out Bibles yesterday, we're preaching to people. There are many people, I believe, that we started a conversation with that we didn't get to finish. Some, there was a seed planted that may take root one day. Others, as soon as they went down the way, the devil found some way in the flesh to distract them and steal the seed of the Word out of their mind and their heart so they don't go home and meditate on it. When we go out preaching the Gospel, there are some people that won't listen, or maybe they'll listen to all of it, but they don't make a decision. Anytime there's confrontation, both parties leave considering the other people, considering their other side. That guy yesterday that said he has to uh, be sinless 100% or he's not saved, there's another one that said you have to endure to the end to be saved. And, of course, that verse is talking about those that are alive during the tribulation, if they uh, survive to that, their flesh shall be saved. It literally says that their flesh shall be saved in that chapter. They misuse that to say you have to remain sinless in the faith or you're not actually a Christian. And this guy is not a, not a Christian. He has a different belief about God. Again, that's the devil trying to steal the word. Any way the devil can get you to cause to doubt, because look again at verse 12. He says, those that by the wayside, are they that hear, then cometh the devil, and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Lest they should uh, turn from all their sin, go to church, get the right Bible, hang out with the right people, quit their smoking, joking, drinking, cussing, all that. No, it doesn't say any of that. Step one, believe. Then you're saved. Step two, discipleship. That's living for the Lord while you're in His kingdom here. If you would, go to Matthew chapter 1. Go back to that. Jesus is Christ. He's anointed. He's King, Priest, and Savior. We see here again that He's Savior. This confirms it. That the name Jesus means He will save us from our sins. This is so important. Let's continue in... Let's continue with verse 21 to the end. He says, And she shall bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Verse 23 gives us an interesting insight. He is called Jesus. He is called Christ, it says in this chapter. But now it says they shall call his name Emmanuel. That's three things he's called. Each of these titles has a meaning. Here, Emmanuel is defined, which being interpreted is God with us. Here's the final title for Jesus we're going to look at today, and that's God. If you don't believe Jesus is God, you have the wrong Jesus. And this is important. This demands a response from you. This demands respect. There are those that they, they'll believe Jesus is anything but God. He can be anybody but God. You can say anything you want, but don't say that he's God, and you're going to offend a lot of people in a lot of camps with this. But the Bible's very clear that he is God with us. That's what Emmanuel means. This, of course, is quoting Isaiah 7:14. It says, Emmanuel, well, actually, it says, a, a virgin shall conceive. In, in, in the New Testament, it says, a virgin shall be with child. We know that life begins at conception. Uh, thank God that the scriptures are clear on that. Um, I want, uh, so what does that mean? Okay, you're confronted with this title. Jesus is your king. You're in his kingdom. Jesus is your God. He is your savior. So what do we need to do? If you would, let's go to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, and I'd like to finish here because we get a glimpse into the kingdom or the response we should have about the kingdom. If you remember Thomas, when he recognized Christ, he said, My Lord and my God, recognizing that this was his God. It changed his perspective, and I believe it changed his life moving forward. 
as Jesus was revealing things to his disciples, it kind of changed them a little bit. If you're in Matthew, or I'm sorry, Mark 8, let's look at verse 27. Mark chapter 8, verse number 27. And Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Whom do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But some say Elias, and others one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answereth and say unto him, Thou art the Christ. He knew what that meant. You're the Messiah. You're the Savior. You're the Anointed One. You're my King. You're my Leader. You're my Lord. You're my God. You're my Savior. And he charged them that they should tell no man of him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. Wait a minute. Jesus forecasted his death? Jesus prophesied he would die and rise again? It's very clear. Verse 32, And he spake that saying openly, and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Now, why would Peter do that? Think about this. He's here to save us. He's here to redeem us. He's here as our king and our leader. And Peter says, Lord, what do you mean you're going to die and suffer and uh, risen again? No, 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 you can't do that. I believe Peter sort of had some personal ambition. Think about it. What if your guy got into office? Oh, man, my best friend, he's going to be mayor. Perfect. I'll get that contract and I'll be set for life. Oh, man, uh, my best friend, my brother, he's the president. You know what that means I can do? Think about it. Peter's there with Christ. He's looking for this physical kingdom. I'm one of your closest servants. He, he was one of the 12. Yeah, he was one of the three. Peter, James, and John were always with him. They were the ones that saw more than anybody else. And Peter's like, Lord, stop saying you're going to die. I've got plans for your kingdom on earth. Don't you know we need to throw these Romans off, and it's time we go down there and take over the synagogue, and here's what we're going to do. I've got an idea how it should go. He rebukes the Lord because he had fleshly, personal ambition. He had things he expected, he wanted. But that's not what God wanted from him. That's not what God expected from him. That's not what God had for him, for his ministry. Look at it. He says in verse 33, But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples and rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. He says, You savor. You love the things that be of men. You love kingdoms. You love castles. You love authority. You love money. You want to be in charge over everybody else. He says, but that's not of God. Why is it just a minute ago Jesus was saying, don't tell this to everybody? Why is it earlier when he healed people, he told them, now you don't go tell everybody, but they published it abroad. Jesus wasn't coming in pride. He was coming in humility. Jesus wasn't coming to take over. He was coming to serve. Now, we want to follow him. We want to be like him. How do we do that? Well, we're supposed to be holy and blameless, harmless, it said, right? Undefiled. Consider that. Look, again, he says, well, just go to verse 34. He says, and when he had called the people unto him, his disciples also, he said unto them, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. If you're a Christian, then God expects you to become a disciple. He wants you to follow Him. And as a disciple, He says, let him deny himself. Here's the problem. We all have things we like. I like it this way. I like that. I have a proclivity. I have a habit. I have this feature. I have this goal in mind. I want to see my little kingdom the way that I want my kingdom to be. And God says, that's not how I want it to be. I want you to deny yourself. Your flesh has desires that go against the Spirit of God, and God says, you want to really follow me? You want to do great things while you're here, and eventually in the next world to come? Deny yourself. Deny yourself. What was the, the proverb of the day that was put in the bulletin? For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. So what do I do? Deny yourself. 
Yeah, but I just want everybody to know what I think, what I feel, I want it my way. I, I, forget everybody else. I want what I want. That's the honor of God. Peter had it wrong. But Lord, we're going to build this kingdom. Lord, I've got plans for your kingdom. I've already got it mapped out. Let me tell you what we're going to do, God. Whoa. Jesus said, you want to be successful? Deny yourself. Verse 34, he says, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That's as if to say, I'm crucified with Christ. That's as if to say, he's died for all my sins, but shall I continue in sin? God forbid. I should take up my own cross, and I should crucify my flesh, and I should not let my flesh drive my spirit. I should do it the other way around. God help me to get control over my body and possess my vessel in sanctification. Help me to live in fear of the Lord, knowing that there's a punishment coming, and help me live by example, just as Christ has given us. We can follow him as we deny ourselves. Jesus knew he was the Christ. He's the king to come. Didn't he ask the Father, Lord, if there's any other way, I can just set up my kingdom today. Can we do that? But not my will, thine be done. And he did. He died. He took up his cross. Verse 35, For whosoever will save his life will lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake in the Gospels, the same shall save it. It's talking about discipleship here. You don't have to sacrifice your life to be saved. But as a Christian, if you do and you give up the things that are in the way, then God says, I've got something great for you in the future. If you lose your life for my sake and for the Gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And that's why we go out preaching the gospel. People are lost and they, 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 they think if I can get enough money and I can build a kingdom, then I can afford the health care at the end of my life and I'll live longer than the rest and I'll be smarter, I'll be better. That's pride. God came in humility. Look at verse 38 and we're done. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation... Of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Now this is written to a person that God is coming for. God will resurrect you one day if you're saved. And in the reward that you get at the resurrection, there's a level of reward based on your choices and actions now. We're saved not by our actions, we're saved by our faith. He's saying here, you live in a very sinful and adulterous generation. They want to talk about the flesh and lust and covetousness, and they want you to go along with them. And if you're ashamed of the gospel, if you're ashamed of Jesus when they're telling their dirty jokes, if you kind of hide your head instead of speaking up, he says, you're losing your reward. When my father says, who's getting a reward? Jesus can say, well, mm, this guy, but not that one. You should have spoken up. That's a reward verse. This is a discipleship verse. This is, what should I do with my life while I'm here? Well, I should speak up in this sinful generation, and one day God will speak up, Jesus will speak up on my behalf, and then we'll be in that kingdom, and then we'll do great and mighty things for Him and with Him and through Him. Don't savor the things that be of men. Are you willing to deny yourself a little more and give God the glory? He is your King. He is your Savior. He is your God. He deserves it. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we know that we owe you. It's our duty to serve you. But Lord, I pray that you would help us to do it from the heart. I pray that you would open up our mind and help us to see how we can uniquely serve you every day. Lord, I pray that you would encourage us and lift up our hands as we're tired and wore out and uh, this earth will wear us out. But Lord, you will give us life and you will give us strength. And Lord, I trust that through your words and through this sermon that you would encourage us to continue on. We ask this in Jesus' name.